We, all, we had a couple teasers for the Brent Spence Bridge, so those presentations are next. I'd uh, like to welcome Ryan Slane, Structural Research Engineer from FHWA Turner Fairbanks Highway Research Center, that will talk about the evaluation of fire damaged and repaired, repaired steel. Please welcome Ryan. All right, good afternoon everyone. My name is Ryan Slane. Uh, I'm with the Federal Highway Administration at Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center. Um, I am a structural steel research engineer and I've been with the organization for just shy of a year now. Today I'm going to be talking about what potentially could have been kind of an academic case study of uh, residual strength of a heat straightened fire damaged stringer that came from the Brent Spence Bridge. Um, James already alluded to, uh, we'll be talking about this for, during this, uh, this bridge during this session quite a bit. Um, I obviously inherited this project since the incident was in November 2020, and I've been in the organization for less than a year. Be relatively brief in terms of the background um, and focus primarily on mechanical testing. So um, the Brent Spence is a double deck bridge. Um, there was an incident in November 2020 between two uh, semi-trailer trucks on the bottom deck, resulting in a fire. Uh, this photo shows a perspective from the bottom deck. You can see quite a bit of distortion in some of those deck stringers, as well as um, charring from the fire itself. It was a multi-hour fire, um, but we don't know exactly what the heat input was into the stringers. You can take some uh, educated guesses based on the charring patterns, but it's still relatively unknown, um, or it's hard to get at least an exact prediction on the heat input. So Kentucky, D, uh, Kentucky DOT and Ohio DOT decided to replace these stringers um, with heat straightening. There's always questions of what is the residual mechanical uh, degradation from the fire? Um, what, what's gonna, what policy, what is policy gonna say? What is the public gonna say? Um, you're doing a repair, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. There also isn't a huge amount of guidance. There is a Federal Highway um, Heat Straightening Guide from 1988 that is currently being updated, and I will touch on that quite a bit more uh, at the end of this presentation. And what we're trying to do uh, was basically, since complete replacement was decided for these uh, stringers, we wanted to get them into our laboratory at Turner Fairbank and assess two major objectives. The first was to monitor the heat input that was created by a prominent um, heat straightener. So that would be assessing the, the patterns that they used to straighten the girder. Uh, I'd be monitoring the upper and lower bounds of the temperature that they put into the girder. Um, the second objective would be to evaluate the mechanical residual stresses. So this would be through traditional dog bone coupon tests, uh, Sharpie impact tests, and microstructural analysis. So starting with objective one, um, we took the stringer and installed it on our strong floor. Uh, we had to invert the stringer because once it was removed from the deck, there was a little bit of camber. So we decided to invert it and discreetly brace it with jacks um, such that the flange that was connected to the deck was at elevation. Um, you can see that bottom flange does have welded C-channels. Uh, those would be embedded in the concrete, acting roughly as a continuous bracing. Um, you can see here that we're only providing discrete bracing, but the bracing is sufficient to reach plastic moment. Um, also of note, this is a 27-inch <coughs> rolled section from a A7 steel, which is from the 1960s, so relatively old. Um, since it's old steel, even prior to A36, there was no fracture requirements or the CBM Sharpie impact requirements at the time, um, which again, I'll touch on in a little bit. And here you can see that there was up to three inches of flange sweep. The sight down the view of the beam is from the perspective of the right side of the elevation view. And that's a perspective that I'm going to be showing in multiple upcoming slides. So here I'm going to show a video of the heat straightening process. See the red dotted lines uh, superimposed on the video? That gives the initial imperfect geometry of heat straightening. And uh, for perspective, the contractor came in at 7 a.m. and they hit the road at 2.30. <coughs> same day. So a lot of heat straightening uh, involves about 20 minutes of work. 
then another 20 to 30 minutes of sitting around and waiting for the steel to cool. Um, there are also can be jack and forces applied. All of those jack and forces need to be applied prior to the heating, and those forces cannot be changed during the cooling process. You're basically trying to apply constraint in the system. You heat such that the material expands against that constraint, and then as it cools, you approach the geometry that you're looking for. So they were actually able to reach the geometric tolerances that are provided in the FHWA heat straightening guide within four heating and cooling cycles. Um, the reason I talk so much about the bracing uh, or the fixity of the beam in our system is since it was discreetly braced, and that's something that these heat straighteners are not generally used to, there was a decent amount of cross-sectional rotation associated um, with the first four heating and cooling cycles they were able to get distortion and sweep handles, but we requested that they run an additional few cycles to try to uh, mitigate that cross-sectional rotation, and they were able to do so um, in a total of 10 heat and cooling cycles. So to assess the heating patterns that the uh, contractor used, uh, we had a thermal IR camera, uh, multiple GoPros, obviously you saw the one that was sighted down the line of the beam, um, as well as thermal crayons. Uh, our IR camera went up to 120F, or sorry, 1200F, um, and that was a temperature that's stated in the FHWA heat straightening guide that the contractor should avoid surpassing. Um, I will explain why that temperature is such a critical threshold in a second. Um, for those of you who have seen heat straightening before, there's various patterns that you can use. Um, for our, or our contractor decided to primarily use half moons to uh, control flange sweep. So that's in the upper left corner, and you can see the representative thermal camera image uh, in the middle on the top. Um, on the bottom left, there was a few times where they needed a slightly more aggressive pattern, and they used a, a full depth V across the width of the flange. And again, you can see the representative thermal uh, on the bottom in the center. And then on the right, um, we see a spot heat, and those were indicative of any repairs done for the welds at all locations and any local bubbles in the flange that need to be repaired. And here you can see a scan, it's basically a laser scan. Obviously this image is not to scale, but it's an eight inch wide flange, and they were able to get within the uh, geometric tolerances. Uh, you can see the, the plots of those scans on the left, and we ran a, a string down the length of the beam, and again, you can see it's pretty straight um, with respect to sighting down the beam. Next, let's look at the uh, mechanical, or the resi residual mechanical behaviors of the steel. So to do so, we ran, uh, again, the uniaxial tension test, the dog bone test, a uh, sharp EV notch impact test, and a microstructural analysis. So I'm going to briefly show you the results just to uh, kind of get not too much of a technical dive into it, but uh, try to highlight the key findings that we had. So here I'm showing results from the tensile coupons. Uh, on the left, I have your yield strength, and on the right, I have the ultimate strength. The blue curves are what I am calling the virgin steel. So this is steel that has been in service for 60 years. Um, so it's not technically virgin steel, but it was away from the fire and it was away from the heat repair. So it should be roughly nominal properties. Um, and that's going, that color scheme is going to be consistent on all these plots that I'm showing. Uh, the red or orange is the heat effect, or the heat affected from the fire, as well as the uh, repaired zones that we were pulling specimens from. For the yield strength, you can basically see that there's a slight increase in your uh, capacity on the flange. But we saw the mo uh, majority of the distortion in the flange, so we expected that those sections would be slightly more damaged than what we saw on the web. So we'll focus primarily on the flanges. Um, but there was a slight increase in yield strength, um, indicative of potentially the plastic strain. Um, it could potentially be a change in mechanical properties uh, from your microstructure. But looking at our ultimate capacity, we're seeing roughly nominal uh, difference between the virgin and the affected. So that's not a good indication of a change in microstructure. 
Next, let's look at percent elongation as well as our impact energy. So our elongation, um, there was some degradation from our flange uh, between the version and the heat affected. So I did put this uh, little dotted black line, hopefully you can see it. It's at 24 KS, or sorry, 24% for a two inch gauge length. Um, you can see that we're well above that threshold for this A7 steel. But we did see noticeable degradation or elongation, so that would be accumulation of plastic strain during the event. Um, next, we'll look at the impact energy. So for A7 steel, there was no requirement for impact energy at the time, as I alluded to earlier. So we were really, we were really shooting in the dark for what the actual uh, measured impact values were going to be. Uh, because we didn't know and we didn't have good inclination, we decided to run the impact test at room temperature, which would be analogous to a, a zone one uh, type temperature. And the threshold for a zone one for a non fracture critical member would be uh, 15 foot pounds. And if you are fracture critical, it would be 25 foot pounds. This should be a non fracture critical member in the bridge. Um, but you can see for the virgin steel, we were getting roughly 50 foot pounds, and for the heat affected, we were getting um, approximately 35 foot pounds. There's been quite a bit of work by uh, Connor at Purdue and with several of his other colleagues uh, that are noted in NCHRP 1063. Their primary focus was to assess uh, impact performance and basically through fatigue and fracture performance. Um, of members that have been heat straightened. For our member, or for our stringer that we got in our lab, we did run a diet penetrant test on it before the heat straightening and after the heat straightening. We did not find any cracks. Um, they subjected their members to impact loads with quite heavy um, uh, plastic hinging occurring, and they did note fractures in their members. Um, however, after and that was also for multiple repairs. So I believe they did took their burgers or their servers up to uh, three impacts and repair states. Um, the critical finding from that work was that if you do have a plastic hinge form, um, particularly through impacts, you're going to get a lot of cold working um, at that hinge. If you just come through with a grinder and remove all of that pro uh, cold working surface, you will mitigate a lot of the potential problems that you do have. And if you do identify through uh, inspections down the line that you do have a fatigue crack growing, if you just grind that fracture or the, um, the fracture surface or the fracture face um, to basically inhibit the growth of that crack, um, that has performed very well in the research that, that they have done. And finally, uh, I want to show results from microstructural analysis. Uh, the microstructural analysis is important because this would be indication of a smoking gun for if you had too much heat input from the event itself or from the repair. So I'm showing um, a 50x view under the microscope of the virgin steel as well as the damaged steel. Um, what you're seeing is grains of perlite and ferrite and we're looking at the relative areas of both um, of the grains as well as the size of the grains. And you can see from these plots that there's basically no change between these two. And why this is so critical, um, don't be too afraid uh, from this image on the screen. This is a phase diagram. Hopefully all of you have seen it in undergrad college uh, through May, or through materials class. Um, I thought maybe this group may, since you guys do have <laughs> quite a bit more in materials and um, uh, chemistry than a lot of the audiences that I'm used to presenting this to do maybe you're more in line with uh, the space diagram. But what you really need to catch from the space diagram is the horizontal line that's at 727 degrees Celsius, uh, equating to approximately 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's going to be your transition between perlite and austenite. And uh, that's going to give a clear indication that you surpassed that 13,400 13, degree temperature range. Um, and we do not have any indication that either the fire itself or the heat repair or the heat straightening uh, surpassed that temperature. So for the key findings from this work, um, 
we, we conducted mechanical and microstructural testing. Uh, we saw negligible de uh, degradation of the strength properties. We saw slight degradation of your impact properties, um, which would play into your fatigue and fracture, but they were greater than what is specified for a virgin steel heat um, that you would install in the field. So it does not seem like the degradation of mechanical properties was such that, that there would be a major concern of conducting the heat straight and repair on the stringer in the field. Um, secondly, we wanted to uh, make sure that the contractor was able to meet the um, geometric tolerances that we stated, uh, that were stated in the heat straightening guide, and they were definitely able to do so. Um, and lastly, we tracked their patterns, uh, wanted to make sure, again, that they're within what was stated in the heat straightening guide. Um, some ongoing work that I need to complete is wrapping or er, uh, bringing these results up to the new recommendations. There is a forthcoming heat straightening guide in front of the Federal Highway Administration. It will hopefully be on the streets uh, in mid to late 2020. Or, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, 2023. Um, it's already been delayed a few times, so I can't guarantee for sure. But we will update our findings uh, based on that report. And in turn for our bank itself, we do plan on conducting some follow-up study uh, very similar to the work in the NCHRP 10-63. Uh, but every time I've given this presentation, I've had multiple DOTs come up to me and say, hey, we get impacts all the time. Uh, fire's a lot less common. Even the heat straightener themselves said that maybe 95% of their work is impact, and only about 5% of it is due to fire. Um, the principles are roughly the same, though, where it's just the accumulation of plastic strain. And if you're monitoring your temperatures during the repair, and if you have some insight, um, maybe it's through charring, uh, or you have various coatings that will melt at a certain temperature. If you have some insight on your fire event itself, um, you can basically uh, rule it to just be an accumulation of plastic strain, similar to what you have at impact. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, if we have available time, I'd like to take any questions. Did you guys look into uh, multiple hits and how many times we can go through? So that's something that we're going to look at in our upcoming work. Um, that's not something that we looked at in this project. This project was basically just saying we have this in situ uh, uh, dam event. Can it be repaired? If it was repaired, would it, be, would it have been a viable solution? Um, and we believe the answer was yes. Uh, the following work will look at multiple impacts as well as multiple fire events. Um, and since, again, that NCHRP report did look at impacts up to three, uh, impacts and repairs up to three times. I have, I have two questions. The, <clears throat> or, regarding arresting a fatigue crack, the grinding versus a rest hole, is there a, you, you mentioned grinding the fatigue crack is a good option. Um, yeah. Could you explain? Since that's not work that we did in our lab, it's probably best for me to punt that to the NCHRP report. Um, but the work that they did, they basically found that if they ground to arrest the uh, uh, the front, they basically did a sufficient job. Because so what they were trying to do was hit the or do the repair immediately, um, not basically do the heat straightening and then wait for a few months and then realize that you have growth of the crack and then arrest it with a I would assume if it was probably multiple months later, later, and the inspector found that crack, he'd probably just core it to the rest of the crack. And do you have a, a is there a rule of thumb? I mean, three inch, three inch sweep on the flame. Is there a rule of thumb where the distortion is beyond tolerable limits? Yes, there is. So in the heat straightening guide, uh, even in the 98 heat straightening guide, there are calculations that uh, basically relate your plastic strain to uh, the flange sweep or just any uh, deflection of the plates for both your web and rear flange. I could I could draw more on, but uh, I figured it'd be less interesting to throw a bunch of uh, equations on the screen. See, a lot of the times these guys come in and our inspectors don't know what to look for. They just kind of say they they know what they're doing and let them do their stuff. Um, is there any post inspection like to say to make a brittle hardness or something to say they did it right? 
In theory, um, according to guidance from Federal Highway, uh, which again is in the guide, and uh, it's something I have to report, uh, point to because I'm Federal Highway now, um, and it's, it is good guidance, uh, the contractor is supposed to provide the entire heat, like the entire plan for what heat patterns they're going to apply. They should provide all of your calculations. If there are jacking forces, they need to know um, exactly how the beam's going to respond. They're going to need to make sure they're not surpassing uh, specified quantities, which is generally half of your class at the moment. Um, in terms of after the repair has been done, uh, well, I guess to continue during the repair, um, the thermal grounds is a very common means to monitor the temperature. We had a little bit of mixed success with the thermal crayons. Um, we found if the if you striked the backside of the steel that they were working from, it generally underpredicted. Under and if you were striking the face that they had just heated, it predictably traditionally overpredicted. Um, and in theory, you're supposed to be able to do either and get the same results. So we primarily looked at our thermal camera for um, the accuracy of the heat straighteners he input, but. Uh, our future publication will have some, hopefully, further insight with some pilot studies to try to assess the quality of the thermal grounds. Um, in terms of post, there is uh, hardness testing that you can do. Uh, FHWA again just recommend that you do a original uh, hardness test. Um, we're actually repairing our hardness tester in our lab, so that's something that's still on the docket. Um, we haven't published this work yet. This is kind of just an ongoing research update. Um, that's the last thing we need to do to close out this work um, before we can publish and then move on to the next phase where we look at multiple impact and repair cycles. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.